up, Stephen Saranac, Chief Executive and Port Director of Port Everglades. Jack Potter, President and CEO of Airport Council International. Don Santa, President and CEO of Interstate Natural Gas Association of America. And Linda Darr, President of American Short Line and Regional Railroad Associations. Leading the discussion, please welcome Neil Bradley, Executive Vice President and Chief Policy Officer for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Well, well perfect. <laughs> We're going to do musical chairs later. Well, thank you. Uh, with the introductions, I think we missed Kevin Burke. Uh, Kevin's with us. Uh, he's the President and CEO of the Airports Council. But since everyone otherwise has been introduced, I thought we would um, jump right in to the discussion. And with that, I want to start um, with Kevin. Uh, you represent airports um, and the airport industry, and we watch uh, passenger travel climb, and we all experience uh, the effects of an outdated airport infrastructure at times when we're traveling. Tell us what you're looking for in an infrastructure package and what you think the biggest needs are uh, for the airport industry. Okay, Neil, thank you, first of all, for the invitation. Um, I like the coin of phrase, we have 20th century airports in the 21st century. Let me tell you why I'm, I'm saying that. Uh, we have 850 million people go through U.S. airports every day, and my guess is everybody in this room goes through one of our airports at some point during the year. Um, that is in 2016. We predict by in five years we will be over a billion passengers going through those same airports. Those airports were built for about half of that capacity. So what we're looking at is passengers in, um, in airports waiting to get on planes. The good news is there's more passengers there than ever. The airlines are happy about it. But the structures aren't there to be able to match the 21st century demand. So and that's both in passenger as well as cargo. So as we see it, we have three big challenges ahead. One is facility modification. How do we match what we need for the 21st century? Um, all of our airports, all of the commercial airports in the United States were built prior to 9-11. Our youngest commercial airport is Denver in International. They just turned 22. Now, if you compare that to how the Chinese build their airports, they build one every two or three months. Um, so what we're looking at is we need a place to put passengers before they get on the plane. We need places to put vendors to be able to serve passengers, to modernize the facility. We also have the, the, the issue of competition. 85% um, of all air traffic in the United States is carried by four carriers, the four major carriers. Think about that, 85%. The remaining 15% are carried by discount carriers. So what we need to do is we need to expand. Airports are in a position where we have to expand gates, we have to expand taxiways, we have to expand runways. We have to adapt to new aircraft. Um, the uh, airports we have today, they are constantly adapting, but it costs lots of money. Uh, when you build a gate for an A380, for example, and Jack knows this uh, at Dulles, you not only have to change the gate, you have to change the concrete underneath the gate considering the size of the plane. So that's an enormously important pro uh, part of the problem. And then, um, since these are all nine, post 9-11 airports, we've had to adapt to the post 9-11 world like many industries have. But we have TSA in the front of the airport, where all of you have to go through. And then we have Customs and Border Protection in the back for those of you who are on international flights. The technology that we have to put into airports, plus the fact that these airports were not built with 9-11 in mind, or TSA in mind. So where we're demanded to, uh, where we're asked to expand the perimeter of airports to build lines to have people go through security. Many of you travel through airports where you wonder, where are they going to put this line? So that's one of the three things, Neil, that we see as major infrastructure challenges. Um, and the and, and last number I'll leave you with, over the next five years, U.S. airports predict that we need $100 billion, that's $100 billion in infrastructure funding, up from $75 billion two years ago. The longer we wait, the more expensive it gets. So those, in my four minutes, Neil, I think I got under four minutes. You they, did. Thank yeah. you, Kevin. So those and, are the three issues. Uh, and I think you've hit on some themes that we've heard today kind of across all modes of right. infrastructure, which is the longer we wait, the more costly this is going to be. Absolutely. So inaction can't be an option. Right. So I, I suspect that that's, I'm going to hear that in other places today, but maybe we can skip to a, a different mode of infrastructure and talk about our, our ports. Um, Steve, you, uh, you head up the uh, port director, the port of the Everglades. What are the infrastructure needs in our ports? 
Well, as an industry, our ports are facing incredible challenges trying to keep up with the multitude of demands on our infrastructure. Uh, we need to, you know, simply put, we need to find a way to leverage our, in, our investments to do it in a smart and proactive manner. We need to scale our infrastructure investments to meet today's demands. We have to grow freight and passenger volumes at our ports. And we have increasing energy and bulk cargo demands on our infrastructure. I'll, I'll cite an example. In 1956, the average container ship carried 500 containers. Now, today, we have ships calling on some of our ports that carry upwards of 18,000 containers. And that number grows. And meanwhile, our country has only just now created a national freight program two years ago, which indicates that the shipping industry is growing, making investments in their ships and companies but for 60 years. But our infrastructure has remained relatively the same through that time period. So as a nation, we haven't really kept up with the demand that's impacting our land side and water infrastructure. It's impacting our local communities. We've seen population shifts in the last decade. More of the country is living in metropolitan regions where ports are located and have the greatest freight movement. But we have, we have to find a way to ensure that the freight and passenger networks can coexist, which means better rail access, more multimodal capabilities, and increased inland distribution facilities. And we're, we're also seeing an increased number of passenger volumes at port. At port Everglades, we're in the top three of a um, cruise port in the world, and we, have, we handle more than 3.5 million multi-day passengers a year. And, but the increased volumes, they're also impacting our, our ports and impacting our local communities. As ports, we import and export diverse cargoes, including automobiles, energy, various bulk products, and our infrastructure must be able to move this freight effectively so our infrastructure investments must be diverse, which means that our industry needs multimodal infrastructure investments so infrastructure facilities can accommodate all, all modes of transportation, trucks, rails, and ships. I also have a dual role. I'm the current chairman of the board of the American Association of Port Authorities, and from a national perspective, I view the impact our ports have. We're responsible for over 23 million U.S. jobs and 321 billion in federal, state, and local tax revenues. And uh, our deep water ports generate 4.6 trillion annually in total economic activity, or 26% of the nation's economy. So these numbers cannot and should not be ignored. And I look forward to working with the chamber and our supporting freight stakeholders on an infrastructure investment package in 2018. I think I kept it under four minutes. You, you did, and, I, and in fact you did, so I'm going to ask you a quick follow-up. Uh, earlier today, Matt Shea, who's the head of the National Retail Federation, was talking about uh, the importance of infrastructure from an industry you wouldn't normally hear about, the, re the retailers. And he mm -hmm. was describing what the costs are for retailers and ultimately for customers, in part because of uh, our inability to modernize our ports and the, the, the costs of, uh, of not being able to get the, the, the largest ships in or having delays. Is that something you think about when you think not just about uh, the, the people you serve, but their customers as well? Sure. I mean, there's constant, <clears throat> there's constant downward pressure you know, on pricing because everybody's trying to do, move the goods effectively, and it's a highly competitive environment. Yet, it's certainly um, an industry that, you know, the investments are significant. If I look at the five-year capital plan at Port Everglades, we're already over $850 million in our program over the next five years. And the demands just continue to emerge on us from the shipping industry. They're all movable assets. They can move. And once you lose a business, it's very hard to reclaim it. So it's a constant dynamic environment by which we're looking for cost efficiencies, but we're also trying to provide the necessary infrastructure to allow the economy to grow. Thanks, Steve. L Linda, you, um, you represent the short line and regional rail uh, aspects of our intermodal transportation system. Um, I suspect that you're not immune from challenges mm -hmm. in modernizing as well. Maybe you could describe for everyone what you see as the major infrastructure challenges. 
So um, there's probably a lot of people in this room that have no idea what a short line railroad is. But just as way of background, I, I think Ed Hamburger spoke this morning. He's my colleague at the American Association of Railroads. And um, those are the class one railroads, the really big railroads like Burlington, Northern, Santa Fe. Believe it or not, the railroad industry is a small business industry. We have over 600 uh, small and medium-sized railroads that operate all around the country. And I think about it kind of like uh, you would think about the Beltway, right? And so you've got the Class One railroads are operating around the Beltway, and we are the off-ramps that go to the customer. We are the spurs. Um, in some cases, like in the Alaska Railroad, the case of the Alaska Railroad, we are really um, the link to a lot of people that would be off the grid otherwise. Um, for us, it's, uh, the challenge is that we are an incredibly capital intensive industry, um, and most of that is privately funded. The, the large majority of that is privately funded. It's probably 25 to 35 percent of our, our operating budget annually that goes to repair and upgrade of tracks and bridges. Um, it costs about a million, million dollars to lay a mile of railroad. Um, so that's, that's no small challenge, especially when you're looking at our small business operators. Um, for us, we kind of inherited uh, some very bad track, unsafe, inoperable. This was back in the 80s when the class ones were divesting of a lot of the short lines that were no longer profitable for them. So we picked them up, our entrepreneurs, and turned them into um, profitable businesses. And it cost a lot of money to rehab that track. It cost a ton of money to do that. Um, so what we did is we went to Congress and we got passed a provision that allows for a tax credit that spurs investment of our small railroads to go out and do the track rehab that we need to do. Um, Four billion dollars has been spent since the credit was passed in 2004. So that has spurred, in, in our world, a significant amount of investment. Um, this is a public-private partnership, so we feel very good about our contribution. Um, now the challenge is to upgrade this rehabbed rail to handle the modern rail car, which is uh, the equivalent of 286,000 pound rail car. So um, in order for us to do that and upgrade our bridges as well, we estimate that it would cost about $10 billion. So um, what we're striving for right now is permanence of our 45G tax credit. Uh, we had tremendous support this year. It's kind of ironic that in a year where tax reform was number one on the agenda, uh, the short line railroad rehabilitation tax credit was the number one co-sponsored tax bill in the US Senate. And um, it's, it's a very popular credit. Uh, the challenge is to try to make it permanent in this political environment, and we'll be looking at that um, in the infrastructure bill going forward. I want to, and we didn't talk about this before, but something you said that um, reminded me, so I probably never told you, I grew up in a small town in Oklahoma. The biggest employer um, was a manufacturing, they made uh, uh, glass Coke bottles and then eventually other bottles. And it was a short line railroad that allowed those bottles to go from our small town to, yeah. to distribution. How important is your industry, when we think about rural transportation, yeah. rural manufacturing, yeah. how important is yeah. that? We are, um, we're the face of our industry really with the customer and in rural America, and I mean, you know, Alaska is a great example of that. There just would be no freight service and often passenger service if it weren't for the short line. But, you know, one of the things that we thought when the Trump administration took office was that we were really in the sweet spot because we are operating in rural America, we are small businesses, the 45G tax credit is a public-private partnership, um, and, you know, we're a made in America business. You know, you can't uh, offshore short-line railroading. So uh, we hope that that message is going to carry forward as we do the work in the infrastructure bill going forward. Um, but it's, it's really critical for the survival of our industry and to make our track safe. Thank you, Emma. Jack, um, you run the Washington Metropolitan Airports Authority. We've talked about three modes of transportation. You have at least three modes of transportation. So you, you manage, what, two airports, uh, you have a toll road, um, this, the new Silver Line, all right here in our backyard in Washington. Um, talk about the challenges that you see from kind of that intermodal perspective. Well, when it comes to infrastructure, if you think about the airport and what was just described, uh, 
the airport's authority is kind of like a city. Uh, and infrastructure, I heard a couple of the earlier speakers talk about infrastructure and they were talking about uh, access to uh, phone service and Wi-Fi. So we've just upgraded ours because everyone wants to come into an airport and be able to communicate and we want to be able to move from hardwired to, to digital technology. So it starts with something basic like that. At Reagan Airport, our challenges, we went from 18 million passengers to 24 million passengers in three years. One runway, 7,500 feet, but some of you, if anyone's gone through gate 35X, the mosh pit, um, you know, we have more people, our, we have a land side challenge. And so that we're gonna invest money, we're gonna change the security, we're gonna make national halls secure now, we're gonna have new security uh, checkpoints, we're gonna build a concourse for those uh, what have been hard stand regional jets. Uh, but I have to tell you, the biggest dynamic for me when it comes to Reagan is that the world is changing around me, not just growing, but as an example, we had in our billion dollar plan, a, a plan to uh, build garages. Well, with the introduction of TNCs, transportation network companies, Uber, Lyft, you know, our taxi is down, our, 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 the number of uh, folks riding the metro to the airport is down, the number of people parking at the airport is down, they're now all on the roadway. So now I have to, we're gonna have to divert what was parking uh, facility monies and move them to roadways. And you will be disrupted, unfortunately, so please bear with us. Uh, out at Dulles, if you've been there, you know that we have a CD terminal that uh, we'd really love to replace, but you have to find the money to do it. Uh, but that is a challenge in making sure that people can get there conveniently. I operate the, the Access Highway and the Dulles Toll Road, and I know that people who've been on the Dulles Toll Road recognize that there's congestion. We're building the Silver Line out to uh, Dulles and beyond. Phase one is open out to Wheelie Avenue. It's a $6 billion project. Uh, I have to tell you, the need for infrastructure is demonstrated you know, throughout this metropolitan area and throughout the country and all the panelists. I would say the biggest challenge that we all have going forward is how do we fund all of the infrastructure that we need at the airports, on the roads, and, and introducing transit. And so, and it's really gonna happen in a dynamic situation. So what I'm looking at is a situation where the world around me is changing as I'm trying to build infrastructure and there will always be those folks who are out there throwing doubt at it, saying, why are you building that? Don't you know something else is coming? You know? and, and you have infrastructure that's built, so I have taxi hold areas. I have a garage for taxis at Reagan. Well, the use of that is gonna diminish over time, but I can't put Uber people and taxi people in the same facility uh, <laughs> without adding a whole lot of overhead for cops. Uh, <laughs> so again, and you think about the, the transition that's occurring, because if it's happening at my airport and the, and the traffic becomes a problem at the airport, think about what's happening on every city street as you're competing for to create bicycle lanes, to create bus lanes as we move to more transit. Uh, and at the same time, the demand for those other lanes of traffic are going up. So in general, I would say we're all challenged by the fact that America's growing. We're challenged by the fact that our infrastructure is old, that it needs replacement, not just repair, and that we need a broader picture. And the other thing I think, just as a comment, you know, I used to run the post office, and I would tell you the, the biggest challenge was building the big buildings that we needed. If we needed a million square foot facility, big, huge project, you'd have the environmental people coming at you, the local politicians coming at you. At the, at the end of the day, money would be diverted to smaller projects. And we would, because it was easy to do, well, we need to spend it or people will spend it. And that's kind of the way government works. The fact of the matter is we all need to put a focus on what are those key infrastructure projects that are out there that are gonna make the biggest difference and make sure that the investment is there and this follow through, even though it's gonna take, you know, three, five, seven years to make it happen. Well, Jack, I don't know if uh, Gate 35X at Reagan falls into one of those big projects or small projects, but I'll tell you, I think probably on behalf of most of the people in this room, wherever it falls, thank you. Um, we're, we're looking forward to seeing that fixed. Well, in reference to the number of complaints I had, it was a top project. So. <laughs> uh, Don, um, you know, none of 
of anything that we're talking about, manufacturing, transportation, anything else happens without energy. Mm -hmm. And um, energy just doesn't pop up in our backyard and then just pop up at our place of business. It's got to have a way of getting from where it's being produced to where it's being used. And um, you are an integral part of that and an integral part of the infrastructure system that we have. I'm wondering if you can talk about some of the challenges that you see, particularly in the natural gas distribution side of, uh, of, of our energy infrastructure. You're right. We've got a uh, remarkable network of uh, energy pipelines in the country. There are some 200,000 miles of interstate gas pipelines, another roughly 100,000 miles of intrastate gas, about 140,000 miles of crude oil and refined product pipelines. So these are a key part of the infrastructure. One of the things that I think distinguishes this from some of the other infrastructure we've talked about on the panel is that it is funded entirely by private capital. For uh, the owners and operators of these pipelines, the interface with the government is not on the funding side, it's on the permitting side. It's the fact that in order to build and operate these pipelines, you need a variety of permits and authorizations, many of them from the federal government, in some cases from state and local government. The shale revolution has created the need for us to replumb our nation's pipeline infrastructure. Because right now, natural gas and oil are being produced in places that, in recent history, were not major producing regions. And so no surprise, there's the need for new pipeline capacity to link that supply with consumers. The other thing that's happened is because of the abundance and affordability of energy, it's spurred demand. And so again, we need pipelines to bring that natural gas and oil and gas liquids to the demand centers. So this is critical infrastructure if we're going to take advantage, full advantage of the economic impetus offered by the shale revolution. I'd say that the greatest challenge for pipeline operators and pipeline developers right now has to do with the permitting process. And it has to do with the fact that the delay and the uncertainty and the cost that result from both the inefficiency of the process and also its, in some cases, politicization is really the biggest challenge in terms of getting this infrastructure built. As I'm sure a lot of you know, the, the so-called keep it in the ground movement has targeted pipelines. And of course, it makes a lot of sense for them. This is long linear infrastructure. It crosses multiple communities, in some cases, multiple states. It requires a whole bunch of permits and authorizations, opportunities to throw a monkey wrench in the gears. But also a big problem is the inefficiency of the permitting process itself. Because a lot of these permits have to be obtained from agencies <coughs> whose primary mission is not infrastructure siting and not infrastructure permits. And so I think there are things that we can do to improve the efficiency of that process and be able to build the, this pipe on a more timely and efficient basis without violating the, the letter and the spirit of the laws under which those permits are, are issued, and, and for good cause, to protect the environment, to protect certain resources, to make sure that this is done in a responsible way. Well, thank you. Um, one of the things we talked about when we were preparing for this panel was, uh, and some of you have touched on it already, but it's a little bit about uh, helping everyone here understand kind of one, two, and three. If you had a wish list for an infrastructure package, what are the one, two, or three things um, very quickly that we want to have a part of that. And I'm going to tack on a question that might be a bit unfair since we didn't talk about it before, but I think everyone on this panel is well equipped to answer it. Um, obviously, having good policy, having good proposals is necessary for getting good policy action. But as we all know as veterans of this town, it's not always sufficient, right? We've got to have the advocacy, we've got to have the push, we've got to get uh, the policy makers to actually follow through on that. If you have one piece of advice for the folks in this room, presumably all of whom want to see an infrastructure package that addresses all the intermodal aspects of infrastructure that we just talked about done, what would you be your piece of advice on, on the advocacy side to get the message out? So um, we'll go back to Kevin, but Kevin, if you would give us a couple priorities and then uh, your good advice for this group about how we turn this from <coughs> ideas into reality. Okay, Neil, I, we have three priorities. The first one, because it's so, infrastructure is so important, is that uh, we are strong advocates of modernizing what's called the passenger facility charge. All of us who fly pay it. Um, it's included in your ticket, and it goes directly from the ticket to the airport minus a fee that goes to the airlines. That fee was instituted 18 years ago, 
and that fee has not been increased. So that $4.50 now is worth about $2.20. It's a key component for when an airport goes out to the bond market to get the financing to build these new structures. Uh, so it's very, very important that that fee goes up. Uh, we're working with Congress on that, um, and it's very important that the administration recognize that as well. Second is a federal grant program called the Airport Improvement Program, which is used primarily for air, what we call airside projects like runways, taxiways, um, and those things that are outside the perimeter of the terminal. Uh, that is a federal grant program that uh, Congress has not moved that number up as much as we can uh, over the years, and we would want to see an increase in that. Um, and the third wish on this, Neil, is um, I was very happy to see that the chamber is now in support of an, a 25 cent uh, increase in what was called the gas tax, and now we're calling it the transportation fuel user fee, as we call it. Right yeah, well, it rolled right off my tongue because I practiced it. Uh, because we're calling it, ours is the, um, the passenger facility charge user fee. Um, it's all, and, and the interesting thing about the PFC is that people who use airports pay it. Nobody else does. The fees do not go into the federal government. And there is absolutely no cost at all to the federal government at all. It basically goes to pay for infrastructure. So what my wish list is that because gas tax is very important, uh, the affected parties in gas tax, the truckers and folks that have supported that. This is a key way to get airports modernized without asking the federal, uh, federal government for a nickel. We're basically saying we want to help finance this thing ourselves. And all that money is local money. It doesn't go to a trust fund. It goes back to its local airports. And so what I'm trying to grasp here is how is that any different? And actually, it is different because the federal gas user fee now goes into a federal fund. Uh, which is controlled by the federal government. The PFC is not. <laughs> so that's an important part of our equation in modernizing American airports. So when you folks in 10 years from now, when there's a billion of you going through our airports, but those airports are now larger, they're more modernized, um, you have an easier uh, way to get through on TSA and coming in on customs. But the only way we do this is a combination of the increase in that fee, um, uh, which is a fee, um, based upon need. Not every airport needs it, and it has to be approved by the FAA. But without it, we're stuck with old facilities that, in, in Jack's case, for example, 35X would be a lot cheaper for Jack and MWA if the PFC was 850 rather than 450. It would cost his authority a lot less money. So those are my three wishes. And the last wish is, is to hopefully convince the chamber of the right way on this thing. This is Kevin lobbying in real time. That's right. Uh, That's right. I might as well do it in front of my colleagues. Uh, right? Exactly. There we go. Exactly. Uh, Steve, what are you looking for? Sure. Um, if I'm going to speak globally for the industry, American Association of Port Authorities has identified three priorities which are needed to address our multimodal freight network investments and port related infrastructure investments. There's $66 billion in needed in federal freight and port-related infrastructure investments over the next 10 years, which includes both waterside and landside investments. We also would like to see full use of the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund um, by providing funds directly to the Army Corps of Engineers to maintain our nation's waterways at their authorized depths and dimensions. And Identifying a multimodal funding source to fund the FAST Act Discretionary Fund and Formula Program. And in the coming months, the AAPA will release the Rail Access and Multimodal Investment State of Freight Report that will identify upwards of $20 billion in multimodal port-related infrastructure needs. Now, these investments are not all done in a vacuum. I, speaking from experience at Port Everglades, I'm operating on a pure profit and loss basis. I'm what they call, um, you know, uh, I'm a utility fund of the county. I receive no direct tax support, so I have to plan my expenditures carefully and spend it wisely. So we need a way to really leverage those investments and, and allow us to do what we need to do. Um, nationwide ports and private sector partners plan $155 billion in investments in the coming years. We have partnerships in place, but we need the federal government to step forward and invest with us so that the private sector and local funding can be fully leveraged. Perfect. Thank you. We're going to give Linda the last word, so we're going to jump around a little bit and let Jack go next. Well, let me, let me just jump on uh, Kevin's passenger facility user fee, PCUF, Kev, is that what we're going to call it? All right. Uh, 
Well, just trying um, to help you, Jack. Obviously, we need the money there uh, for for airports. Uh, again, there's a lot uh, over a hundred billion dollars of investment that's required at our airports, and that's a way of having the users of the airport make a contribution to the investments that are being made. Uh, in addition, obviously, the Highway Trust Fund. I operate a roadway. Uh, uh, you know, I think the key here, though, is that. A lot of times, people are looking at federal grants for things, and, uh, and there are alternatives. And so one of the things that we took advantage of, when I look at the uh, Metro extension, the Silver Line, an extra 23 miles onto the Silver Line, a $6 billion project, I took a look before I got here, look at all the funding sources that we had. We had a grant from the federal government, we have money coming from the airport, because we're going to have uh, two airport stations. We have money coming from the two counties that are affected by it. We have money coming from the Commonwealth. We have a Northern Virginia uh, funds coming our way. And we have PFCs are helping pay for the airport's contribution to this, as well as we have a TIFIA loan. Uh, and the TIFIA loan was fantastic, a $1.8 billion loan, very favorable uh, payment schedule because it was after the project uh, goes live and it was low interest rates. And so I think what the federal government needs to do, given the, the vast obligation or requirements that you're, you're hearing about for the future of the country, is figure out how do they infuse some cash into the system that, that has a multiple. And the multiple on a TIPI loan is 14 to 20 times what they put in it will actually be spent. And so I think we have to get very creative in terms of on the, the funding and really look at mechanisms that can enable people across the board. The fact of the matter is, uh, if you just calculate what we've talked about today, we're probably up over $500 billion that would need to be infused. And it really doesn't need to be infused day one. As I described, some of the larger projects are over time. There really needs to, everyone needs to step back, and I, you know, I encourage the federal government to do this. We all have our needs and wants. But somehow, collectively, we've got to look at this from a big picture standpoint and figure out, are there mechanisms, and again, I think the TIFI alone is fantastic, and other that encourage, you know, Buy America bonds, whatever they are, uh, that would be able to be spread across and be infused into the system as projects are ready, knowing that there is a broad horizon of when these projects really would begin to spend money. Okay. Don, I know permit streamlining is probably at the top. Other things, you, one, two, it. and three? <laughs> You've got it. Uh, permitting reform, uh, the, the House passed the pipeline permitting bill uh, in the last session. The bill's pending in the Senate. An infrastructure bill would be a good vehicle to get that across the finish line. Section 401 of the Clean Water Act, not enough time to go into the details of it, but suffice it to say, this authority that has been given to the states to certify compliance with their water quality laws is being abused abused by the state of New York to thwart interstate natural gas pipelines, was recently used by the state of Washington with respect to a rail facility. I think that's something that we need to address as part of an infrastructure bill. And then finally, not so much within the bill itself, but as you know, the president issued a lot of executive orders last year. Some of those had to do with permitting reform and infrastructure. And I think there are things that could be done there that would be a great complement to an infrastructure bill. For example, concurrent review of applications by federal permitting agencies using, to the extent possible, the same application. Ensuring consistency within federal agencies in terms of their policies and application of federal laws. Think about the number of agencies and bureaus within the Department of the Interior that have something to do with permitting or authorizing energy infrastructure projects. And then finally, while there's a fundamental statutory problem, what can we do perhaps to circumscribe the ability of the states to abuse Section 401 of the Clean Water Act? Thank you. It, 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 it may be in the weeds, but it's a critical topic mm -hmm. to go back to the first problem you described, which is the not in my backyard, keep it in the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and and thank, I'm glad you raised it. Uh, so Linda, you're going to get the last word, word on right. priorities and how okay. we get this done. All right, um, mine's pretty simple. Uh, num number one, probably not surprisingly, is permanency for the 45G tax credit, which is the lifeblood of our industry, so that has to happen. Um, second thing is to make sure that short lines have uh, greater eligibility, especially in the rural America parts of any infrastructure package. 
The third thing I would say is uh, a focus on modal equity. And um, that's very important to us because I know, um, you know, probably like a lot of people in this room, I spent some time in government um, at the Department of Transportation and watching uh, the different modes kind of compete and how the policies impact the, the, the diversion of freight or passengers from one mode to another. I think we need to be very, very careful about that. Um, so for us, looking forward in, at the infrastructure bill, a concern would be how our main, con our main uh, competition, the trucking industry, is uh, taxed for the infrastructure that they're using. Um, whether it's a user fee or vehicle miles, travel, tax, uh, we want to make sure that whatever that policy is doesn't shift uh, freight from, from rail to the road. Uh, I think all of our uh, transportation modes need to be engaged and fully effective if we're going to handle uh, the economy, the surging economy that we anticipate coming forward, which is good news for all of us. So the two things that I would say to you about how to lobby this and what, what the chamber can do, I think the first thing, and I think the chamber does this very, very well, is to uh, ensure that you come to the table with solutions. Again, if you're working in the government, I don't care if you're you know, in Congress or if you're in the administration, you've got a million things on your plate every day and a million people that are coming in and whining to you about something. And so if you're coming to the table with a solution, and you've got specifics, and you can quantify what the impact is, that's going to be uh, the successful proposal. So I think that that's uh, number one. And, and number two, have that sensitivity to um, the modal equity, because I think that uh, you don't want to create an enemy by proposing something that is going to create some type of a shift that's not going to be uh, good for the US and, and um, generally good for consumers. Thank you, Linda. I think that's great advice, and I, I hope you all will join me in thanking our panelists today for uh, helping us uh, wrap up this portion of our, of our event today with kind of a broad look um, at infrastructure. So thank you.